Welcome to Exponential Church's online experience. We are back to our live in-person services and we want to invite you to join us every Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. We meet at Renaissance Charter School in Tradition, located at 10900 Tradition Parkway here in Port St. Lucie, Florida. It's super easy to find us. Just drive west all the way to the end of Tradition Parkway and you can't miss us. We are at the end of the road on the left. But we understand that some people are not ready for the large gathering type setting yet. So that's why we are continuing with these online experiences. This is a condensed version of what a Sunday morning like experience would look like at Expo. But it is the same sermon that Pastor Steve is going to be preaching to those who are gathering for the live services. So you're not missing out on that. If you don't want to feel alone watching the message today, just smash that like button on this video and then share it with your friends on social media. Or if you're watching on YouTube, copy the link and text it to your friends and family. You never know, this could be a life-changing message to someone you know. So without further ado, let's open God's Word and worship Him this morning. debuted a commercial during the Super Bowl this year and it was, uh, it was played a lot during the Olympics. The reason is because it's an emotionally gripping ad that highlights a Paralympic swimmer named Jessica Long. Jessica Long is one of America's most decorated athletes of, of, of all time. Uh, uh, she has even already, she has racked up even more medals this past week as the Paralympic Games have, have kicked off. But uh, her story is, is very compelling. Jessica Long was, was born in, in Siberia, but her birth parents put her up for adoption, so she ended up in this uh, Russian orphanage. The difficulty being that she had a rare condition that meant that she was going to have to lose both of her legs. They were, they were going to be amputated from the knees down. But as the commercial depicts, her, her adoptive parents, they didn't care about those, those issues, those hardships, if you will. They adopted her anyways, and, and the rest is, is history. Or, Actually, it's history in the making because she is still competing as, as a swimmer in, in the Paralympics. The commercial ad is titled Upstream, kind of portraying, playing off that idea that, you know, sometimes life we have to swim upstream with, with the hardships and things. And, and the message at the end of the, of the ad, it says, we believe there is hope and strength in all of us. It, it's such a great and a positive ad with, with even a, a, a better message. That, that message, though, about hope and strength, not everybody believes it. The, the, there are people in our world who they feel weak and they feel hopeless. Maybe that's you listening today. My, my, my prayer for this message is to convince you that there is hope and strength inside of you. Even in hardship, there is hope. In order to do that, to convince you of this thought today, we're, we're going to dive into the first part of Mark chapter number two. We, we've been in this series now, Disciple, and, and looking uh, through the book of Mark in the eyes, the lens of a, of a disciple in the midst of uncertain and chaotic times, right? And, um, and, and how to find hope in, in these times. And we, we've already talked about this, this town of Capernaum. We talked about it last week and, and how it, it kind of became Jesus's uh, home headquarters, if you will, during his ministry years. We, we looked last week at the buzz that Jesus created the first time that he was there with his, his teachings in the synagogue and, and then his healings that, that took place afterwards. The end of Mark chapter 1, it shows us that Jesus left Capernaum to, to go and to preach to other towns. But then here in Mark chapter number 2, we see that Jesus, he comes back to Capernaum. And it didn't take long for people to find out that, that he was back. Here's the thing about the people of Capernaum. They were curious, but they were not converted. And in fact, Matthew and Luke's Gospels uh, record for us Jesus' message of woe to some unrepentant cities. And Capernaum is one of those cities that is mentioned. 
Look at this passage, Matthew chapter 11, beginning in verse 20. It says, Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done, because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethesda! For if, if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have been repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more tolerable, uh, more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For it is the mighty works done in you had been, for if the, the mighty works that, that were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you, it'll be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. How sad is it that Jesus was in their homes, but not in their hearts? But anyway, here, Jesus, he comes back to this town, Capernaum. Word gets out that he's home, and immediately, again, all that curiosity that we talked about last week, it, it is still there. And, and, and so immediately, they, they flock to the house where Jesus was. Now, many of them, they, they assume that this is the same house that Jesus was in in Mark chapter 1, that it would be Simon Peter's house there um, uh, that, that he was in, uh, which kind of adds a funny element if you think about Peter's character and, and what's going to happen in this story here. But uh, but but it's here in Mark chapter number 2, in, in this house that was just the impact full of people, that one of the most iconic moments of Jesus' ministry takes place. Read it with me here in, in Mark chapter number 2, beginning there in verse number 1. Look at what it says. It says, When he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts. Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately, Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Rise, take up your bed, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. Look, in order to convince you, that there's hope and strength inside of you today. I want you to look at this story of Jesus healing this paralytic that was let down through the roof of a house. And I want you to see three aspects of this paralytic. Number one, I want you to see the helplessness of the paralytic. When we read this passage of, of Scripture, you'll count five times that this man was called a paralytic. The Greek word here indicates that this man had some sort of malfunction in the motor area of his brain, or, or maybe there was a spinal cord injury. But, but either way, this man's muscles were incapacitated. He, he was crippled. He, he, he could not walk on his own. He was totally dependent on others to carry him wherever he went. And because of that, most paralytics in these days they would not have many people to depend on. They, they, they were too much of a hindrance or, or an inconvenience to society, if you will. They were, they were an inconvenience to, 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 for people. To, so a, a lot of paralytics in, in these days, they would end up homeless with, without anybody to, to care for their needs. And in all reality, this is what we are without Christ. We are spiritual cripples. In Ephesians chapter number two, you'll read these verses, the first two verses of the chapter. It says, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, 
following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. The Bible says that we were walking dead, if you will. We were basically cripples. We, 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 we could not do anything. Verse number 12, Paul says this, Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. This is exactly a picture of what we are without Christ. We are spiritual paralytics. We are cripples. And this verse here, verse number 12, man, it's a powerful one. You see, there's a, there's a trend or, or a popular belief that's, that's running through the modern church these days that says, man, if you have Christ as your Savior, you should not think about your sinful nature. A popular phrase when I was growing up in the church was, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. But today's modern thinking says, man, just we shouldn't look at ourselves as sinners anymore be, because of God's grace. That's not who we are. We, we're now a child of God, and we should just focus on that. And, and man, listen, it's, it's a catchy trend, and, and it definitely makes me feel good about myself. But, but Paul's command here in Ephesians chapter, 12, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 12, goes against that modern thinking. Paul says that we should remember our condition before Christ. A time when we were separated from Christ. We were strangers to the promise, the, the hope of heaven, if you will. And because of that, we, we had no hope because we were without God. Think about that for a moment. Without God. A pastor and author, his name is John Piper, he put it this way. He said, if he was, if he was not our God, then he was not for us, but against us. He was not our justifier, but our condemner. Not eternal life, but eternal damnation lay before us. And it's just this that Paul wants us to remember. Remember that apart from Christ, Almighty God would be against us. Apart from Christ, we would be storing up wrath for ourselves on the day of the righteous judgment of God. Apart from, uh, from the free and unmerited mercy of Christ, we would go away into eternal punishment. Or as Paul says in a single phrase, we would be utterly without hope. Remembering our helplessness without God, it reminds us of the hope of the gospel. This paralytic, he was, he was helpless. And that is a picture of what we are without Christ. The second thing I want you to see here in this, in this passage is the healing of the paralytic. The healing of the paralytic was, was quite a scene. We've talked about this before at Exponential Church here, but, but, but imagine being in the house when all of this happened. And again, imagine if this was Peter's house and this was happening. And we know Peter and how he was, right? So imagine how he would have been flipping out in this moment, right? But imagine being in that house. Imagine being the homeowner who, you know, had his roof destroyed by these guys. And, and imagine, you know, all the dirt and the grime and everything falling down on you in all of this. But, but, but I had another thought this week while studying this passage. The thought came to me, this, this thought here. Why was this man, this paralytic, why was he not healed the first time when Jesus was healing everybody in, in Capernaum? You remember Mark chapter 1, verse 32, 33, and 34? It says that evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. Now, I just got to think, of, why was this guy not healed that time? Now, we, we, we know because Mark chapter 2, verse number, uh, verse number 1, we, we're, uh, the end of Mark chapter 1 and the beginning of verse number 2, we know that Jesus left Capernaum and then came back. But we don't know how long it was. Maybe it's a month, maybe it's two months, three months, a year. We don't really know. So maybe this paralytic, maybe he was new to town. And maybe that's why he wasn't healed that night. Maybe he was one of the, the one of the many people that we talked about last week who who would pass through this trade town there of Capernaum, and and maybe he just happened to hear about Jesus while he was there this time, or, and this is what I think, maybe he was there the first night, 
Maybe these guys had, had brought this paralytic to Jesus the, the first night, but, but maybe he was too far back in the crowd and he couldn't get to Jesus. Maybe that night Jesus ended his healings before this guy actually got to the front of the line. If, if you look at the passage there, it says they brought to him all who were sick, and it says the whole town was there, but then when you read it, it says Jesus healed many of them. It doesn't really say that he healed all of them, right? So maybe it was, maybe this guy was in line to get healed, but he just didn't get there in time. He didn't get to the front of the line and Jesus called it a night and, and, and went to bed and that guy didn't get healed. And just maybe, just maybe that is why these guys were so determined to get in front of Jesus this time. Maybe it was this time they were like, man, we ain't taking no for an answer. We're not going to wait in the back of the line this time. We're going to do something about it. We're going to be proactive about the situation because they were not going to miss out on Jesus again. It wasn't going to happen. Let me ask you this question. How determined are you to get your lost friends, your lost family members, your lost coworkers in front of Jesus? We say it all the time that, that we're praying for those people to get saved. But what are we doing to get them into the presence of Jesus? You say, well, I, I'm practicing lifestyle evangelism. You know, I'm just actively living out my faith and I'm hoping that they'll, they'll see my faith, they'll see my walk, and that they'll, they'll want to be a, a part of it. And listen, man, that's great. We should be living out our faith. We should be letting people see and know that we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. But remember that your lost loved ones are helpless cripples. They're helpless cripples. They're, they're paralytics. Somebody has to bring them to Jesus. Imagine if these four guys looked at the helpless paralytic and said, hey man, I just want you to know that we're praying for your healing. Jesus is nearby though, so we're, we're, we're going to go and worship with Jesus and, and we're going to pray for you while we're there at church. What do you think that paralytic would do? You, you think he'd say, man, thanks, guys. I really appreciate that. I, I, I'm glad to see you guys are living out your faith and that you're faithful to, to go to church and, and those types of things. You think that's what he would say? Or do you think that paralytic would look at those four guys and say, take me to Jesus. I want to be healed. Take me to him now. And imagine that that's what your lost loved ones are doing. It's time that Christians, that we get so determined to bring people to Jesus that they'll not let any excuse get in their way. They'll carry, carry people and they will tear down roofs if need be just to get people into the presence of Jesus Christ because that's what this world needs. That's what your lost loved ones need. And on the flip side, there are Christians today, you're being crippled by sin but you've got no determination to get healed. Oh, you're curious about it. You, 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 you'll say things on the outside like, you know, man, you, you, you're outside the house there and you're hoping to maybe get a glimpse of Jesus. You're, you're hoping maybe that Jesus will come to them and, 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 and to heal them or to heal you and, and, and forgive you your sins and to cleanse you and those types of things. But, 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 but man, listen, think about this for a minute. Jesus doesn't come to us. We go to him. Too many Christians want healing from a, a crippling sin, but they don't want to do what it takes to get out of that sin. And I could go on and on here, and I could list a bunch of different sins and the excuses that we make with those sins, but I've got a pretty good feeling that the Holy Spirit's probably already put your crippling sin in your mind right now. And you know what you need to do. Are you determined enough to do it? Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Jesus said, Come to me. All who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to Jesus today. Lay your sins down before him. Lay your, your crippling sins and the things that are holding you back from Christ. Lay them down at his feet and say, Jesus, I can't do this anymore. I need you to heal me. And here's the thing. When the helpless are healed, then we see this third aspect of the paralytic. We see the hope of the paralytic. The hope of the paralytic. The, 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 the Paralympic Games I mentioned earlier kicked off this week. It's amazing to me to see that just because someone has a disability, they can still compete at, in, in, in athletics at, at a very high level. And it speaks a good truth for us today. Being disabled is not a dead end. But man, listen, this wasn't always the case. 
as a paralytic in, in Bible times, that this man had no hope. Well, what I have observed in Scripture is that it seems like when, when, when you were paralyzed in Bible times, you were kind of abandoned by your family. I mean, think about the, 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 the paralytic at the, at the pool of Bethesda. Remember that the water would be stirred and the first people that would get into the water would be healed. And, and, and there was this paralytic guy that was there that Jesus came to him. And he said, man, why haven't you gotten healed? And he's like, I don't have anybody to put me in there, right? Where was his family? Where was his friends at to, to put him into the water when the waters were stirred? And then there's this guy. You notice that it wasn't his family who brought him to Jesus. It was his friends. And, and, and to be honest, I'm not even sure what kind of relationship these guys had or what kind of friendship that they had. The Bible doesn't actually even call them friends. It just mentions four guys. Maybe these guys had been healed by Jesus. And, and as they were walking away, maybe they saw this paralyzed guy and they knew that Jesus could heal him too. And so they thought, man, we had something good done for us. Let's do something good for somebody else. Maybe that's what it was. Maybe they had witnessed the healings before and maybe they just decided to, to randomly help this guy. We don't know anything about their relationship other than they were not his family. Either way, this paralytic started this day hopeless. He could offer nothing of value to the world around him, and, and he was not given the time of day by most people. But then he got in the presence of Jesus, and now he had hope. He could go find his family, and he could offer to help them around the house and around the family farm. He could look for a wife and start a family. He, he could work and contribute to society. Maybe he could become a fisherman there in that fishing town of Capernaum. His options were endless at this point all because of an encounter with Jesus. Notice what, what took place with this healing though. We haven't touched on it yet. Jesus' first miracle that day with this paralytic was to forgive his sins. Jesus took care of the spiritual before the physical. And here's the thing, hope begins with trust in God. And that means we must turn loose of ourselves in, in, in our own efforts to control things, to become dependent upon God for everything. Romans chapter 5, verses 2 down to verse number 5, it says this, Through Him, talking about Jesus, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, Knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. But there's something deeper here that I want you to see that Jesus did in this moment. You see, anybody could look at somebody and say, your, your sins are forgiven. That, that, that's an invisible miracle, if you will. There was nobody that could prove him wrong at that point to say that. But to tell a paralyzed man to get up and walk, that's an undeniable, visible miracle. And so Jesus here in this moment, he was showing them, everybody in that crowd that day, but specifically these scribes, he was showing them his power. But man, there's more to it. You see, the scribes, the scribes had this doctrine or, or this belief that no sick person could ever get well until his, his sins were forgiven. Because they believed that, that all of your ailments and all of your sicknesses, they believed that that was a result of sin. And so they didn't think that you could be sick and be healed until you're forgiven of your sins. So Jesus was showing the scribes by their own philosophy that he had, in fact, forgiven this, this man of his sins. They couldn't deny any of it, not the spiritual or the physical. Jesus gave this man hope, and he showed the entire crowd his power to save. This paralytic, he went through some hardships, but even still, there was hope and strength in his life because of Jesus. I mentioned earlier about Jessica Long, one of the most decorated U.S. athletes of all time. And, and, and I talked about you know, the hardships that, that she's faced. Abandoned by her parents, ended up in a Russian orphanage, having to lose both of her, her legs from the, from the knees down. 
And then I mentioned to you the, about the Toyota commercial that depicts her life. Jessica Long said in an Instagram post about this commercial, she said, this is so special to me because I don't think I would have ever imagined that me, a girl born with no legs and adopted from a Russian orphanage would ever have this type of opportunity. She went on to say, this process has reminded me that my parents wanted me truly and completely and loved me even before my success. I read her words and I immediately thought, that is every Christian's life before Christ, crippled and abandoned with no hope for a future. But Christ, he wanted us. He wanted us truly and completely just as we are and he loves us despite of our hardships he loves us even before our successes if you will he says in that while we were yet sinners christ loved us he loves us despite the hardships of our lives and if you're listening to this today listen i want you to know more than anything else jesus loves you jesus loves you and maybe your life is rough. Maybe you're going through some hardships. Maybe your life has been nothing but hardships for the last several years. Or, or maybe you just can't even look back on a time in your life when there wasn't any hardship. And you're, you feel weak. And you feel helpless. And you feel hopeless in here. The, 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 the most hope-filled words in all the world are the three words, Jesus loves you. He loves you even in your hardships. And Jesus wants to give you hope. Thank you for joining us for our online experience. If you gave your life to Jesus today or if you have any more questions, please feel free to email me and I'll get back with you as soon as possible. If you'd like to invest in the ministry of Expo Church, you can do that from anywhere as you have two easy options. You can text the dollar amount to the number 84321 and follow the instructions to give that way. Or you can go to our website, expochurch.com, find our giving tab and follow those instructions. I want to thank those of you who chose to be faithful in your giving to this ministry. And I want you to know that your generosity is helping meet the needs of those in our community, as well as reaching people across the world through our global giving to missionaries around the world. Thank you again for joining us today and we hope you have a fantastic week.